Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. We are joined by Stephanie Teal of the Rainmaker Group. Now, Stephanie is two times Salesforce certified and for the past two years has been building the Sales Ops function at Rainmaker Group from the ground up, uh, has previous experience with a VMware product and sales operations as well. So I'm looking forward to diving into this right now. Stephanie, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, we'll kick off with the first question. How did you initially sure. get into sales ops? Because from your LinkedIn profile, you've had a variety of different roles before jumping in, and I wanted to understand how you first were exposed to the role. Yeah, so straight out of college, I actually began working in sales. Uh, so I've been on the front lines, did that for three to four years, I'm not the best salesperson, um, and I was always looking for something that was a little more analytical, more process-oriented. So the couple times that I had the opportunity to do that from a sales standpoint, I knew that's the direction I wanted to go career-wise. And uh, <clears throat> a good friend of mine from college, we had actually studied abroad together over in Germany for a bit. I noticed he was working at this startup called Airwatch. They had sent him to Australia to help build out an office there. And they were looking for a sales operations analyst. And I'm like, I don't really know what this looks like, but the job description looks pretty pretty interesting to me. Uh, so I pinged him. He actually referred me for the role. And that's how I got started at Airwatch. That was my introduction to sales operations in general. And uh, it was a crazy ride. Uh, Airwatch was an Atlanta-based startup turned unicorn. Uh, we ultimately got acquired for one and a half billion dollars by VMware. And uh, that's where I earned my sales ops stripes. That's where I got started. Uh, quick question. Why do you think that you weren't good as a salesperson? Yeah. So for me, I, I, I struggled with a, a couple things. Uh, I, I'm, I'm borderline between extrovert and introvert. So reaching out to people, you know, doing the 50 dials a day type scenario is not necessarily my cup of tea. Um, and I wasn't very persistent either. So if somebody was like, yeah, we're not really interested, I was just like, okay, sounds good. Talk to you later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so definitely missing uh, some of the uh, assertiveness, I think, from a, a sales standpoint. Got it. Um, and then fast forwarding to the Raymaker group now. Sure. Um, can you give us a flavor of the, the size of the operations team supporting the amount of sales reps so I can get the ratio of operations people to sales people? Yeah, I feel like this is always a good question. So uh, Rainmaker, uh, I've been there for four and a half years uh, and we've been through two acquisitions now. So when I first started, uh, they didn't have any sales operations folks. So I was the first one there. Uh, the company was founded back in 98. So when I started in 2015, it was one to 20 plus sales folks uh, and really just trying to figure things out. And shortly after that, we brought in a, a Salesforce admin and a sales enablement person as well. So I would say, you know, we got it up to about three people su supporting that larger sales organization. And then in 2017, uh, Rainmaker sold off the multifamily portion of their business, uh, which was a, a large acquisition. But then we had the, the hospitality side remaining. So we work with the hotels and casinos. Um, and we, we sort of like lost all of our systems and, and a couple of those folks. So it was back to one. We uh, converted one of our admins to a sales ops specialist and then over time added a Salesforce admin as well. Um, so a smaller team, but a lot of uh, rebuilding that needed to be done. So at our max, we got back up to three to about a 10 to 12 person sales org. Got it. Okay. And because you're also certified in Salesforce, right? So it sounds like quite a technical sure. sales ops team you have running. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would say so. And, and we really grew from just being sales ops to, we call it commercial ops, but really starting to think a similar concept to, to revenue ops that some people see or biz ops. Um, but really starting to look at across the entire company, how can we start to take the information that, that's maybe gathered at the very beginning of the process, like an SDR is collecting information. That information is used by many, many people throughout the organization. So instead of doing something multiple times, like let's do it once, let's capture the information. And then how can we figure out how to make that information flow, not only to the sales rep, but to the folks who are going to implement or deploy the, the product 
after the deal is done. And then even the support team who's supporting those customers once they've signed on and they're up and running. Got it. Um, can we now quickly talk about the tech stack you have running at the sure. maker group at the moment? Yeah, for sure. So uh, Salesforce is our CRM. I think that's pretty common <laughs> nowadays. Uh, you know, if you're trying to run with the big boys, Salesforce is, is the go-to product there. Uh, we use Sales Cloud and Service Cloud. And, uh, and then from a marketing automation standpoint, uh, we're on HubSpot. Uh, we just got acquired a little over a month ago, so we'll be uh, actually flipping over to Pardot there um, in, the, in the coming months. Uh, from an outreach standpoint, we use SalesLoft, we use LinkedIn Sales Navigator, and then have really worked to automate some of the contracting portion of the, the sales process with Conga Composer and an eSign tool as well. Got it. And your team is responsible for managing and maintaining and training for all of those tools? Uh, we own everything except for HubSpot. So we own the integration of HubSpot into Salesforce, but our marketing team handles the, the setup of HubSpot and the actual outbound emails and campaigns and things like that. And how is that integration between HubSpot? Because we currently use Pardot and Salesforce, which yeah. for obvious reasons have a good integration. Um, have you ever had any issues with that integration or have it worked fine for you? Um, we may have had like a, a, a couple minor issues, uh, but nothing that I, that really jumps out at me. So I would say in general, we've, we've had a, a considerable amount of success in, in making those two systems work well together and talk to each other. Yeah. Yeah. You would expect that HubSpot would invest heavily in the integration with Salesforce, right? Because, um, yeah. probably a lot of the customers, they want to use Salesforce. Um, sure. now, Shifting to Salesforce itself and the issues around data quality, what are you currently doing to maintain and ensure data is accurate within CRM? Yeah, so this is the uh, the age old question, right? If anybody had a, a perfect answer, um, I would be very impressed. But from my standpoint, look, I think data quality is actually the responsibility of the entire organization, right? So I think Sales Ops ultimately owns. Um, the data quality and maintenance from a system standpoint, right? We have the the, op the ability to put in validation rules, required fields, tighten up permissions on who can add what kind of data. Uh, we also use a, a tool called Demand Tools, uh, which I'm sure you've heard about many times, uh, I assume, on, on the podcast. Uh, but it's a great tool as far as being able to, to do regular data cleansing, deduping, merging records, Things like that. Um, so we basically have it set up. So every Friday we'll do a, a, a massive clean of the system, make sure contacts, owners are aligned with account owners and standardize some of the data, populate missing fields and things like that. Uh, but ultimately, I mean, I do think it really boils down to the broader organization needing to have buy-in that your CRM is your go-to. It's the source of, of truth for the organization. And the folks who are out there talking to customers need to be putting that information into the system as well, right? So from sales ops standpoint, I can do a lot of, of the system stuff and, and the generic cleanup, but there's no way for me to know if, if Bobby just switched companies, right? So you, I need the, the salesperson or the customer success rep or whoever knows that information to be updating that in real time as well. Got it. So it's like a two-pronged approach. You have the changing the culture, then you have your weekly check. Absolutely. Some of these got it. Awesome. Um, now shifting to the sales team, mm -hmm. do you have any tips on, uh, say, influencing a salesperson to come and do something that maybe they maybe it's not in their direct self interest? Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, the thing that salespeople tend to care about, I don't, you know, it's a broad statement, but um, a lot of times they want to know why they're being asked to do something. And then the other side is like, what's in it for me? How is this going to help make my life easier, help me hit my quota faster, get paid more? Um, so they really need to understand, A, why they're doing something, and B, how it's going to actually help them out. Uh, one thing that I've also found, uh, this is for sales or anybody, right? So is is being able to identify a champion. Uh, as a great example, we had a customer success person join our team early last year. And... Uh, one of the benefits of working at Rainmaker is uh, they, they cater our lunches uh, three days a week. So it gives us an opportunity to sit down and, and have some conversations. And uh, this customer success rep, you know, the first week he's, he sat me down and he's like, 
okay, uh, you know, if I wanted to do this in Salesforce, how would I do it? And if I wanted to do this, or how does this work? And he started asking questions. Then he also started asking for for changes to be happening in Salesforce and, and was already thinking about ways to improve the process and get his team on board and get them out of Excel spreadsheets and into the system and look at this cool dashboard. So if you can find somebody that's like that, who's engaged and interested and is really the champion, a lot of times it's a lot easier for other folks in, in the, the organization, whether it's sales or customer success, to digest the changes if it's coming from within their own team. So um, that's not always going to be the case. A lot of times the leadership team will come to me and say, hey, we need to fix this or I'll notice something's broken. I won't necessarily have a champion, but if I can get uh, a rep to at least have some input or provide feedback, I think that helps and goes a long way as well. The champion, the champion from within the ranks. The yeah, team. for sure. Uh, so Alex just asked the tool that you use for deduping. That was demand tools, right? Correct. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Um, onboarding salespeople. Do you have any tips or any tools you're using to get people to reduce ramp time? Yeah. So uh, from from Rainmaker's standpoint, um, we're a pretty small sales organization, uh, and we don't onboard a ton of reps. So. I would say our approach is a little bit different. If I think back uh, at AirWatch, I mean, I would say there wasn't a week that went by that we weren't onboarding like five or 10 reps every week. So I would say there's there's definitely a different approach depending on your company size and growth rate and, and sort of the style of the company. Uh, so from Rainmaker's standpoint, we're pretty small shop. We have the occasional rep join. We can We can sort of white glove the the onboarding process, right? And give them exactly what they need. We curate, uh, you know, a, a condensed document of like, start here, go through these tools. And then we can have more of a just-in-time approach to training. So instead of, you know, day one, like here's Salesforce, here's how you create an opportunity and build a quote and send a proposal, we can give them sort of the high level, let them work through, you know, a couple of weeks. And then once they start talking to prospects and have an actual opportunity to work through, then we can sit them down and, and go through that. So that, that's probably a luxury uh, that most people don't have. When I was at Airwatch on the flip side, so we had a, a team that was dedicated uh, sales enablement. Our Every rep's first week at Airwatch was spent in training. They learned company history, product knowledge, sales process, Salesforce, um, by the end, they had to get certified on the product. Uh, so very formal system. Uh, and then once they got out of that first week of training and, and actually went out to their sales teams, our, our setup at that point in time was that we had a sales operations analyst that was dedicated to like two or three sales teams. Uh, but they basically had a, an individual sales ops person that they could come to to ask questions if they needed help with getting leads converted or needed a report or to dig into their territory, any of that type of information. Uh, our sales ops team worked hand in hand with the sales teams and the new hires to make sure they were on board and ramping up and, and quickly able to start producing results. Got it. Um, can we now move to the, the sales forecasting process? Um, sure. Are you guys responsible for producing that forecast or do you present then data to someone outside the head of sales to produce it? Yeah, so I'd say uh, we take sort of a collaborative approach on the sales forecast. So we have regular sales forecast calls with the sales team. Um, and then we've set up Salesforce to be able to generate a system forecast as well. Pretty common. Uh, I, I think one thing that we've done that's maybe a little bit unusual is that uh, we've actually separated sales stage from sales probability. Um, so just because you're in an early stage doesn't mean the deal is going to get done necessarily. Uh, just because you're negotiating a, an agreement doesn't mean there's a 90% chance of uh, prob probability of the deal getting done either, right? So we sort of separated those. Um, and we'll then, when we pull together a forecast, we'll, we'll base it off the probability, which is tied to what we call deal confidence, but it's the same as forecast category. Um, so we'll pull a, a weighted amount based on the probability and then work with the VP of sales who knows the nitty gritty details about some of the deals. And he'll give a verbal call as well. So we've got the system forecast that's pulling out based on just the data that's in Salesforce, the probability that's been set. Um, and then our VP of sales sort of um, 
I guess, rounds that out with some additional color as to what he thinks will actually happen. Uh, and that gives you the ability, if your forecast is you know, a little bit inflated because you've got a couple big chunky deals that may or may not happen, uh, the, the VP of sales then has the ability to, to chime in and just add some additional color there. So the initial probability, is that set by the rep? Yeah, so it's set by the rep using uh, what we call deal confidence. So, the, you know, if they're committing a deal, it's a 90% probability. If they're saying it's probable, it's a 75% probability. Um, so just a little bit more flexibility, but independent of where they're at in the sales process. And then you also have that second kind of check by the VP of sales, because maybe he knows that a specific rep is more yeah. optimistic. All right, okay, cool. Um, Definitely. Okay, and is there anything that you're doing right now to to drive productivity uh, with the reps? Yeah, I mean, I think our approach, I touched on this a little bit earlier, um, but when I started at Rainmaker, I, a lot of stuff was, and this is like most companies, right? It's not unique to us, but, um, you know, a lot of times you see folks working out of spreadsheets, passing Excel docs around, things like that. So we really tried to, again, make, Salesforce be the system of record and then capture a piece of information once and then pass it along in the process. So um, uh, I would say one of, one of the biggest things that we've done this year is really work to automate our, our contracting process. So with the click of a button after a quote's been approved, we've agreed to terms and pricing and things like that internally. Uh, our reps can literally just go click a button and it spits out an agreement. They can send it electronically to, to be signed. It just speeds up the process. It also makes life a lot easier uh, on the customer side, right? And, uh, obviously, but like they don't have to print out a, a document, sign it, scan it, send it back. Um, so we're just looking to, to find ways to sort of eliminate a lot of the back and forth emails, keep everybody in one place working. And then where we can automate stuff, we definitely want to to streamline that. Um, another thing that we've done recently is, is work on the handoff process, right? So once a deal gets done, you've got a team who's got to actually go out and deploy it. So we've really worked to streamline that information, again, getting it out of Excel and into Salesforce, but then also minimizing the data that the sales reps have to, to put in because they've already done it once on the opportunity in the quote. So we just want to take that information and pass it along to the next team. And that's what we've been able to do through using Salesforce and custom objects, automations, email alerts, things like that. Nice. Um, and then from your career in sales operations, what has been a metric that has been the most insightful to you? Yeah. Oh, man, there's so many metrics. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think if I had to boil it down to a single metric, um, I, I, would, I would start to look at activity metrics, right? So activities can tell you a lot. It, it's not a perfect metric. So I think sometimes, uh, and, and I feel like we did this a little bit at AirWatch, we just looked at a, a strict number. Did you hit 50 calls a day? Yes, no. Um, so I, I do think it is important to, to look at like, well, who are you reaching out to? Are you targeting the right folks to begin with? What's your mix of, of outreach, right? Is it just email? Is it phone calls? Is, is there a combination? Uh, but activity is, is the one thing that, that reps can actually control, right? So if they're targeting the right folks and they're logging the right activities, getting demos booked and scheduled, and they're not getting the results, then that gives you a little bit of opportunity to dig in. And maybe they're not doing a good job of qualifying, or maybe they're jumping to the demo too soon. But uh, that's the one factor that, that a rep can control. So I think if I had to boil it down to, to one single KPI, which is, again, hard to do, um, I think I would, I would start by looking at activities for sure. Got it. And final question, who in the world of sales ops has taught you the most? Yeah, so this is a good question. Um, I've got a, a couple answers on this one. So if I think about my time at Airwatch and really like learning the ropes and just figuring things out, I mean, I have to think back when we started, I think I was like 25 when I started there and I was like the old person at Airwatch. Uh, but there was a group of like uh, 15 of us, I would say. And, and we were basically straight out of college, just figuring stuff out. So, I mean, I have to think of like Lauren and Jenny that I worked with at, at Airwatch uh, as a couple of the folks just, you know, banging out Excel reports and Googling how to do stuff in Salesforce. And, and we were all just, you know, scrambling, but trying to figure it out. 
uh, John Marshall, our, our CEO at AirWatch, I mean, he uh, really instilled a sense of just like constant reporting cadence. If it's not in Salesforce, it doesn't exist. Uh, and impeccable attention to detail. Um, so I think a lot of us Air, AirWatch folks still have some of that, uh, that John Marshall influence, uh, to say the least. And then uh, one of my favorite resources, and I talk about this all the time, I'm in a couple different ops Slack groups, and uh, I feel like a broken record by now, but one of my favorite resources, and I, I constantly go back to it, is uh, Matt Bertuzzi's Lightning Sales Ops book. It's like less than $5 on Amazon, so I would recommend everybody go buy it, but it's like a step-by-step process on how to get leads from SDRs to AEs and everything in between, right? So he ties in marketing, SDRs, AEs, and then like the leadership and reporting. Uh, not going to lie, I ripped off <laughs> or I borrowed uh, some of his processes and things and have implemented them at Rainmaker. It's been very successful. And I love that book. Just It's so tactical and hands-on. So if you're looking for like, how do we pass leads off to the sales team? How do we, what kind of reporting do we need to have in place? That book is hands down my go-to. And that's by Matt Bertuzzi. Matt Bertuzzi. Yeah. Got it. Hopefully, hopefully like he'll send me a signed copy if I keep talking about yes. it or something. <laughs> yes, he will. Um, awesome. So here are the things that I, that I liked. Um, your point about how, if the SDR has some data, it's not just a sales team that want to use that. And actually, you're part of a commercial operations team, right, that spans not just the sales department, which I think is very topical right, right now. Um, the two things, so most people I ask about get influencing salespeople, most people say they are interested. You have to communicate to them the benefit, which you've said, which is what's in it for me. But the other thing that most people don't say is you have to say why we're doing it. Um, and so when you couple those two together, I think that's quite powerful. And then really interesting about separating stage and probability. Um, and I think it kind of makes sense, right? Because these are two different metrics and they've been lumped together when maybe they're not actually aligned. So I think that's a really good insight as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, on that specific point, you know, I think there, there are probably two schools. So uh, most people are used to having it lumped together. Um, but I think it probably is more accurate to, to separate the two. It can be confusing for the sales team as well. So maybe worth testing out for folks, but um, it's definitely a, an interesting approach. Uh, our chief commercial officer a few years ago rolled that out and uh, it's been interesting for sure. <laughs> okay so if people want to learn more about stephanie they can go to they can probably google stephanie teal or go to yeah. stephanieteal.com we will link to it below this video um and stephanie it's been very insightful thank you so much for giving us your time awesome thanks i've enjoyed it <laughs>